<laughs> well, it's good to see everybody. Thank you for being here this morning, everyone. I was just saying, you know, it's a really wonderful opportunity that we don't often have to be able to be together uh, in, in this kind of way. So it's really nice to bring community together. And I know that there's a lot of overlap between the two communities, Assisi Institute and also Deaf Psychology Alliance. And I definitely have been a huge fan of Michael's work. Many people know that for a long time. And I, I myself have done the two-year pattern analysis training and certification with ACC Institute, and it's just been such an amazing experience. So really well, thank you guys for the work that you're doing there. Well, you're very welcome. And as you know, both Michael and I are fans of you and the work that you're doing and bringing this work into the world in just a tremendous way, uh, you know, bringing the scholarship, bringing the soul. Um, I think that that is such a big part of what ACC Institute is all about. And really, that's the legacy of ACC Institute is really, it's not about programming. It's not even about curriculum. It's really about soul and, and depth psychological scholarship and community, people coming together in community. And I think that is one of the, um, one of the hallmarks for ACC Institute. It never ceases to amaze me each time we do one of these conferences as we get together and we meet the new students. We have students here with us this weekend, literally from all around the world, uh, Colombia, Russia, um, Canada, a number of different countries represented, but the common denominator is a real passion for learning um, and, you know, and for insight and for soul and for bringing something new into this world. And that's really what your work is about. And you're, you're moving it forward in tremendous ways. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, it's, it's really, I mean, it's a calling and anybody who's doing this kind of work obviously knows that and understands it, but it, it can't happen without the community piece of it. So again, I just feeling particularly grateful for everybody who's, who's really moving this work forward in, in the same kind of way and, and just doing the best they can. So it, it's, it's wonderful work. I wonder if we can just talk about Michael for a couple of minutes before we join him. I know he's going to be starting his talk very shortly at the conference there. So I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to join him. And just so everybody knows a little bit, after we join him, we're just going to go away, Laura Lee and I, and we'll let Michael have the spotlight. And then I'm not planning necessarily on coming back after he finishes. So we'll just end the conference at that point. But let's talk about him for just a minute since he's not here to defend himself. <laughs> Michael's a great person. I, I love his sense of humor, but, but more than anything, he is really, you mentioned a word that is really important for me in this scenario, and that is scholarship. He's truly a scholar in every way of this kind of work. And, and more, he has a very unique take on, on the, this particular topic, which is archetypes and pattern analysis and, and dream work, which he brings brings the archetypal stuff into it. It's very union, and that's the word that always uh, you know, appeals to me because he does stay very true to Jung's work in this, and um, he doesn't go off on tangents. And not that that's a bad thing, because all of us are always creating and recreating in a new and different way, but it's really wonderful to have the access to that kind of fundam fundamental scholarship and, and uh, tenets from Jung. So I wonder if you can just say a few words about you know, how you perceive his work. And then I had a, I underlined, if you guys don't have this book, you have to get it. It's really, it's Michael's really core basic book, Field, Form, and Fate, Patterns in My Nature and Psyche. Absolutely fantastic book. It outlines everything. I have it hugely highlighted in notes. So um, I, I wanted to read just a couple of excerpts from there, maybe if we have time. Uh, um, Lorelei, before we launch into that, do you have an ETA a bit on, on well, I, I do. I can hear them kind of congregating and filling in that room behind me, Bonnie. So at some point, maybe when you're reading that quote, I may disappear just to do, a, you know, just to do a quick check um, because I know I can hear the crowd getting in there. So I say within the next, I'd say four to five minutes, we should be ready to ready to go. Yeah. Perfect. Right. Um, okay. Well, um, so by way of introduction, maybe you can just share a little bit about what it is about Michael's work that has appealed to you. Because this is such a, a profound, again, it's not, maybe not for everybody. I think it's probably for everybody who's in this crowd. And so we have kind of an easy crowd here. But, but what is it that really stands out the most or, or that you think is the most memorable about Michael's work? Um, well, that's a huge question. It's a great question. Um, I understandably, being transparent, may be a little biased since I happen to be <laughs> not just a student, but happen to, to know Michael very well. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, um, 
you know, one of the biggest pieces that I think I appreciate and in the culture that we're in, at least here in the United States in particular, tremendously is the relevance of this work. And, you know, Neumann and Jung both talk about and write about how the evolution, the individuation process of the individual is reflective of the collective, or rather that the collective is reflective of the individual. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is one of the things that I constantly am impressed with is that when we um, take the time to look at the inherent wisdom of the image from what some would say might be a classical Jungian approach and take a look at it in that way and just wring it dry, look at it symbolically and wring it dry, we see the tremendous wisdom and relevance for ourselves personally and our own individuation process and then taking it out beyond that the relevance of that and of what psyche is wanting to bring into the collective. And, and I think the ability to do it in community like we do here at Assisi Institute creates a container and a temenos for the numinosum, mm -hmm. which I think if the work ultimately that you're doing, that we're doing, that we're doing on ourselves and that we're wanting to bring into the world, I think ultimately is a transformational work. And I don't think that that transformational process can happen without the numinosum, without that coming into the room and without us making room for that in our, in our own psyches and souls. And I think that that is one of the hallmarks of Michael's work. And it comes out of a very authentic passion and love he has of learning um, and of growth. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I agree with you. And, and both of you hold that very well. And again, that it keeps coming back to community for me. Um, <laughs> sorry, I, I, just I know. I'm sorry. I just need to step out because I know. Do you have the feed on your screen? I'm not seeing it. Do you have the? I, I don't have it yet. So it's. Right, so let me step away for a few minutes, and when I come back, we'll be ready to go. Okay. All right. That's Thank great. you. Thanks, Laura Lee. For those of you who don't know, uh, Laura Lee Scott Conforti is actually married to Michael Conforti. I think you guys probably got that. And she really does some amazing work in her own right. So it's been really lovely to have a chance to work with Laura Lee. If you haven't seen it, actually, Laura Lee and Michael are hosting a conference in October called Seeing Red, which is about the archetypal roots of violence to the feminine. And so that should be a really profound conference. That is happening, I believe that's in Connecticut as well, where they're located. And so if you're interested in that, you can find that online. There's a, there's a link at an event page on Depth Psychology Alliance in the events section, which will actually give you more information about that. Or I think you can just Google it and it will probably come up if you're interested in that. And even if you can't attend the conference, um, you might want to know about the initiative because it is definitely a growing initiative, which is really important. Hi there. <laughs> So um, let me just share a little bit about Michael Conforti's work with you guys. Again, I had referenced this book, which most of you probably were here for that. And if you're just joining us, welcome. We're going to be joining the live feed with Michael. Oh, it looks like he might be starting. Let me see where they are. Hang on a second. Okay, let's just join Michael. <coughs> so we're live streaming. Yes. Okay, I want to welcome everybody. This is Dr. Michael Conforti, founding director of the CC Institute. The International Center for the Study of Archetypal Patterns. And I want to welcome Bonnie, Bonnie, Dr. Bonnie Bright, who is the founding director of Deaf Psychology Alliance. It's a group where they brought, I don't know, what do you have by now, but five or six or seven thousand people around the world are part of Deaf Psychology Alliance. And she's bringing people together to study human psychology. And it's been a wonderful contribution. So I want to welcome the community. We have many people coming, uh, part of that group today, and it's also being recorded. The, this weekend conference is on an archetypal developmental approach, what shapes a life? And it was a biologist, Schrodinger, that asked the question, what shapes a life? And he said, well, we can talk about the biological issues, the, all of the formative issues in life, but we really can't ever say, what is it really shapes a life? Well, Neumann and Jung and Esther Harding, one of the great unions from the start, Address the question not what is life, which again more is a biological question with Schrodinger, but what shapes life. And that's what this weekend is about. And what my presentation about today is into the swirl, which is looking at looking at the fact that there, this is an archetypal transpersonal developmental model. And what happens when the transpersonal issues are eclipsed by the personal? And 
Neumann calls the law of secondary personalization, which we're going to get into more about right now. But a couple of basic uh, and opening announcements I want to make. This is our probably 27th year of doing programming. We began in Italy in 1989, the first program. And uh, ever since we've been programming in other parts of the country and the world. And now we are located here in Stonington, Connecticut, right on the ocean, I mean, the finance of the ocean. And it's, a, it's really a historical moment for us. And now we shifted our name, we've been ceasing to do for all these years, and now the international study for the study of archetypal patterns to really reflect the fact that it's international. And how we got there, I was coming home from Bogota, when Kaval invited me and guests from Bogota, and coming back and realizing, oh my God, here I am going to this other country with these people I never met. We knew each other 25 years ago. And seeing that this work is growing and growing, it's not local. And I said, let's change the name to reflect it. The other big thing I'm really happy about is a major announcement from the incident. Something we've been thinking about, something I've been holding under my collar for about a week now. <laughs> Not that well. <laughs> okay, you want to know? Okay, it jumps out. But anyway, I thought, wouldn't it be great if we had a couple of scholarships that we can offer people that really want to do this program that don't have a hell of a lot of money? And I've never in my life asked for money. It's not, I couldn't do it. The thing happened was many years ago, I read a piece by Maya Angelou, did you say that? Mm -hmm. And she wrote a piece about gifts. And she talked about it. she was asked to help the university, her alum, we she went to college, to get money for the library. She said, I'd be happy to do this at a great cause. And I said, wow, that sounds easy. It's a great cause. <laughs> so anyway, we have a godfather to this program that passed away about 10 years ago, Dr. Jorn Kaufman. Mm -hmm. He was really one of the founding figures of what we've done there. A lot of our work is built on his contribution and his And his wife, Risa Kaufman, is probably the best teacher I've ever met in my life. And those of you that have had the good fortune to meet her, you know what I'm talking about. A scholarship, a warm, she's from the Bronx, she's at the Bronx attitude. <laughs> and, 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 from astrophysics to what she's looking at now is the oppression of the feminine, much like the scene web project. And they called her up here and I said, uh, can we talk? I said, Michael, what are we going to talk about? And they said, I've got this idea. What about the possibility? No, it's strange, you're kind of back in the way the whole conversation. What about if we offer a scholarship to students that want to do this program and don't have money? <coughs> And we call it the Risa and Young Kaufman Scholarship. Mm -hmm. So when do you want it? <laughs> when do you want this? I said, you're not kidding me. I said, you really? I said, how do you really feel? I mean, Auntie, how do you feel? And she said, I know you only want it. And you would give it if you could with warm hands. She can't. She said, I will give it with warm hands on both of us. And it's a scholarship in your name. So it's being set up right now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it's going to be for two students every year, where it's, it's a partial scholarship. We know from, especially when you come from other countries, and those of you in the States as well, it's a, it's a challenge. You know, from coming from Russia, from Bogota, from um, Canada, from Brooklyn. We were in Brooklyn, you travel from Brooklyn, it's a lot of stuff. Get you. <laughs> but, and, then, and then there are some wonderful students you know, living here that, that just that struggle. <clears throat> And I've always thought we had the money, so it's a major, major step for us. So that's starting the Risa Young Kaufman Scholarship. And there's a second scholarship starting up with the Alumni Society. People that are graduated from the Institute, they say, we really want to contribute. So, big announcement. So, we'll get paperwork out so you guys can look at it. And if you have people interested and you want to apply yourself, just let us know. And I think it's a great way to begin this program. And to acknowledge the fact that we have people here from literally from Russia, from Persia, this, from Persia, from, Bogota, from Colombia, from Canada, we have Denmark, we have, from Denmark. Um, Where else? Philadelphia. Philadelphia. <laughs> Famous in the Philly cheese sandwich. So I, I grew up in very old and I've always loved it, the sense of people coming together from different cultures. So, 
The other thing I want to say in my introduction is probably one of the best compliments we ever received was back in about 10 years ago from one of our beloved now deceased colleagues, Mario Nicole. And he said, Michael, what you established, what your community, this community has established, is, is close to everyone that we'll ever see again. Where they brought together Heinrich Zimmer, B.T. Suzuki, Neumann, all the greats around the world, to talk about the workings of the psyche in the world, internally and externally. So, upon that, we build a program this week. So, for Bonnie, C.C. Kennedy, welcome. And we'll be we're approaching a, a wonderful subject, a challenging one. People that read Neumann struggle for a lot of reasons. You know, he's dense, he's a dramatic quality, how he writes. But let me, in my intro, I want to try to frame you know, that what I sense he's been doing with his work. Neumann offers a archetypal perspective on human development. And what he goes on to say is that development is only partially a personal process, where we develop our own, our own likes and our dislikes and our own rites of passage and all. And he goes on basically to say that every single rite of passage is archetypal. And as a way of setting the stage here, think about the different rites of passage in our life. Okay? Obviously, we all begin and we are, there's a conception. And it was Jung that said, the beginning stages of life really start at conception. To use the, the CC language, the field begins. The field of being loved and adored and wanted. The field of, like narcissus, being conceived in rape and hatred. <coughs> and the thing that is exciting and also disturbing is when you realize that those initial conditions seem to set the stage for the rest of your life. Now, it's not that we're puppets, it's not that we yoke it for the rest of our life, but you begin to see that something seems to happen as a result of the conditions that we are, we find ourselves in. Now, think about family backgrounds. Now, we all are born into some kind of family. Some families are good enough, some families are wonderful, some families are absolutely mad. The violence and the terror. Other ones you feel like you're just shrouded with love and affection. And you begin to see how it begins to shape a life. And you begin to see that there's something very stable that goes on in your life by these initial conditions. Another one of these major shapers of life is think of your grandparents. And there are many articles written by the, about the grandparents. And as I talk, try to have at least double if not triple vision. Parents, conception, family, grandparents. Because beyond the personal is an archetype on every time. That, that's the brilliance of Jung and Neumann's words. So when you talk about meeting the grandparents, I mean, what if you just even the word, the grandparents? The grandparents are the representatives of the archetype on earth for us. The grandparents are the representatives of the cultural canons of our family. We grew up and the grandfather from Calabria and grandmother from Palermo on one side, they, they really held that family together with their values. And the kids knew, no matter how old they were, that these were the, the, the pillars of the family. And you somewhat dreaded the day when they were gone because the pillars began to fade and not a lot of people had the same abilities to hold the, the next generation. Now begin to look at what happens as we mature in life. <clears throat> we go to school. Now again, think. And this is, again is the brilliance of Neumann's work and what we've been trying to build on here. Every one of these situations represents a field, an immersion into a field. It's an immersion also into the imagistic world. And Neumann and Jung both said that the unconscious produces images because images initiate the process of assimilation. Isn't that brilliant? I'll say it again. This is both the only point. He said, the unconscious produces images and situations because images and situations initiate, or use another word, excite the conscious mind to assimilate the context. Okay. 
So when the image comes, we, be, we get excited. Something happens. We interact with it. You go to school. And uh, you begin to meet other kids. You leave the confines of your own home. You think developmentally. You're leaving the confines of your home and your family. And then you do what you want for six, seven hours a day. All of a sudden, you get dressed up. I went to Catholic school for 11 years. You know, you get dressed up. You go to school. And you suddenly have to say goodbye to mom. And you say goodbye to daddy. My mother walked me to school for the first 10 years. <laughs> 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 and she packed my lunch every day. And the truth, that's the first thing she has to remember. Now that I remember so well, I remember the story. She cried her way, walking me to school. And she hid around the building all day. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then what she did was, you know, I'm all done. People figured she found a place in Brooklyn where we lived. And she bought a Hummel at the boys' first day of school. You ever see it? It was a little school in the school. Yes. And she waited all day for that bell to ring. So before the kids even ran out, she was the first one to put in watching. Michael, are you an only child? I am an only child of my mother and father. My father has two other daughters. I'm the only one. Oh. <laughs> 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 and an Italian family. <laughs> But again, what you're getting is really important because you begin to see and say, say these stories. You begin to realize that each of these immersions are immersion into a particular field with their own spin, their own initiatives, their own rites of passage, and their own dynamics. And when you image these fields, you begin to see that. Each represents part of a journey. And that's another way this talk could be framed today. It's both the descent and the ascent of the ego and the unconscious. In many ways, as I was working on my notes, I said, you know, in part, this is somewhat of a love story. It's a love story of how ego works with the unconscious and hopefully creates an amorous relationship throughout life. Now, of course, we know that's not always the case. We know there's only too well in the world today how much strife there is. Not that you know by the American political situation, there's no strife, and everything's really copacetic there, things are really smooth in America. <laughs> but it's a love story in the sense that there is this ongoing encounter between the, the unconscious, where we begin, we hear about that with your voice, with Edward talk, and, and how there's an emergence. And what Neumann is getting at by these different examples that I'm presenting is that we begin in a state of undifferentiated unconsciousness. We're just a mission. We're just swimming in the waters, and we're the water, we're swimming. It doesn't make a difference. We're just in something. But we don't even know where we are. And slowly but surely, there's the beginning of, I mean, like a speck, like a little speck in the ocean, right? Of an ego. Not form, just a hint of something developing. And in many ways, the, the, the journey that Neumann provides for us is understanding how that ego begins to develop. Now let's go slowly. In the Freudian world, in ego psychology, behavioral psychology, and basically every psychological approach, it's all about the development of the ego. Do you have a strong ego? Okay. You make it, you know what you're doing, you get it. Deal with the storms, deal with love, deal with whatever comes up in life, you get the ego. And the ego, if you draw it through the diagram of the big circle, the ego is always the center of the bullseye of that circle. It's not the other side. In the Jungian frame of reference, the ego is but one of many complexes. Huge difference, right? The ego is but one of many complexes. And it's the job of the ego to midwife and assimilate contents from the deep unconscious. So when we look at these journeys, like the little boy going to school for the first day, if, if you can have this vision, like you're watching a good movie, watching a play, reading a good book, or your own child going through these things, and if you have this double vision and this archetypally informed vision, you realize you're watching the beginning of the ego as it makes its initial separation from the world of the mothers. For many, it's unimaginably traumatic. Well, my mother was traumatic. I admit, my mother. 
you get a little boy, three, four years old, it's going to be rough, right? It was unbelievably traumatic for many reasons. Our work as pattern analysts, many of you in the room are pattern analysts and are interested in this kind of work. Your challenge is to look at a given situation and ask what is the archetypal backdrop? Okay. Now what that means by archetypal backdrop is where is the ego and what's being asked of the ego in this initiative? What is the unconscious, what are the unconscious mandates? And what are the unconscious mandates offer or pro-offering to the ego? What are the particular challenges that the ego begins to face as it says, Mom, I don't really want to go to school today, or I can't wait to go to school. Like, get me the hell out of the house, or I don't want to. Whatever the particulars are going to be, you know that the journey is being set right there. The mother that says, you know what, um, I'll, I'll be here. I'll be here for the next three weeks. I'll wait outside, and I'll cry all day. You've got an archetypal story. And where you begin to read patterns is because you begin to see that each of these stories are so deeply etched because it's not, and this is mine's brains and yours brains. It's not your story or my story. It's the story of the liberation and the emancipation of the ego. The beginning stages of emancipation of the ego from the unconscious. Being played out against the backdrop of mommy and golden school. It's, brilliant. it's a brilliant, brilliant model. And as we begin to look at these other stages, say when there's the child all of a sudden, they, they do the school, maybe third, fourth grade, and uh, say, hey, you want to come over to my house today? And then you go to your friend's house, and you've never been to another house, except with your family all the time. Do you realize what's happening to the ego? And it's not, again, the ego in a sense of listen to ego psychology. It's ego having to begin the experience of embracing a larger and larger world, a more deeply textured world. And the more we are closed off to other experiences, the more rigid the psyche is going to become. The more rigid the ego becomes. And Neumann goes on to say that one of the, one of the downfalls of religion parochial systems, political systems, is a rigidification of the ego. The ego is not allowed, to, I'm a Republican, I can't do that. Uh, I'm, this, I'm a Catholic, I'm a Jew, I'm Protestant, I'm a Mormon, I can't. And what happens then is all these things in these religions and the political biases become a substitute ego. Meaning your own ego is no longer doing the work of this journey. And much of our analysis, excuse me, our analysis is, is looking, is looking all the time. How is the journey going for this person? Are they open to the unconscious? Are they open to that? Learning a new language. I mean, do you realize what it means, learning a new language? I mean, ladies, they got lost living in from another country, speaking foreign language, they get caught, they get lost on the highway. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a rough experience. So then we begin to go to a kid's house, and then we begin another thing. Like, you know what? I want to, I want to, I like to dance, or I like to dance. I want to, I want to try dancing in school. I want to play that. I want to play ball, stick ball, play a little, whatever. And then you got to try out. Try out today at four o'clock. It's huge because what's happening at that point is maybe you're playing in your backyard or you're shooting in the backyard, you're playing your harp in the backyard or in the basement, you do, you're a movie star, you're great, I'm Will Chamberlain, the best, you know, whatever it might be. And then suddenly, that individual, that little ego that's still pretty beginning, you're a kid playing your harp, a kid singing in the basement, mom and daddy love it, right? And grandma loves it. Mom and daddy think I shoot baskets pretty good, all of a sudden, the journey goes from the world of the interior to the external world. You're beginning to interact with the collective. That's a big deal. It's a huge deal. For many people, the process stops because they cannot negotiate the ways of the external world. And I want to read a couple of lines that are some really brilliant pieces here that we get from Norman. I can't read.
Okay. So he writes, so this is just from the introduction. The emergence of the, I can't see this, the emergence of the collective human background is a transpersonal reality has forced us to recognize the relativity of our own position. I'll read it again. You get that nicely? I can't see too well. Just this one's of the emergence. The emergence of the collective human background as a transpersonal reality has forced us to recognize the relatively relativity of our own position. Yeah. Yeah. Any attempt to outline the archetypal stages from the standpoint of analytical psychology must begin by drawing a fundamental distinction between the personal and transpersonal psychic factors. Okay, go to the next page. Okay. Okay. Pers personal factors are those which belong to the individual personality and are not shared by any other individual, regardless of whether they are conscious or unconscious. Transpersonal factors, on the other hand, are a collective, supra, or extra, extra personal, and are to be regarded not as external conditions of, of society, but as internal structural elements. The transpersonal represents a factor that is largely independent of the personal, for the personal, both collectively and individually, is a late product of evolution. Thank you. Yeah, it's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Can you catch what he's saying in this? He's saying again that, he, that development is not just an individual thing, that there are these psychic structures inherent, embedded, and made in the personality that are going to be guiding life. Then he goes on to say, it, quotes here, I can't see it too well. This incredible piece, he said, generally these processes go and unfold in a relatively healthy way like biological processes. The organs develop and the, the things develop and the metabolic processes develop, okay? And life is pretty damn good until something happens. We got a lot of uric acid. I just had two weeks of uric acid build up and I was in pain like hell. Everything's good until it happens. <laughs> or when you have some metabolic disabilities or, or you have suddenly the heart or an organ starts and, and life becomes more and more curtailed. He's making a point, not by drawing on a biological analogy, but by drawing on the confluence between biological and psychological processes. And Freud tried, well, when you read Freud carefully, Freud made some brilliant correlation between the biological, trying to make a biological model for unconscious processing as did Langs. Okay? But anyway, the point he's making here Let's use that image again of the kid going out and she wants he or she wants to go do dancing and try dancing with the team, whatever, or they want to try to play ball with the team. There are these natural unfoldings where we do go from playing in the backyard, singing for grandma, grandfather, mom, and mommy and daddy. We do it as it should be. But when, when Norman begins to say, but there and there are these innate processes that you will inevitably have to go through in this journey, in this love affair between the conscious and the unconscious, between the ego that's having to navigate its own inner world, its own personal inner world, and these archetypally mandated processes. If it goes well, if you follow the next step and you say, I want to perform, I want to do it. I'm going to make that journey. I'm going to try out. You do it because it's mandated. You need at some point to interact with the collective. It's inevitable. How many shut-ins have we seen in our life? How many people that, very gifted people, they, they find some very clever ways that I'm not gonna be part of the collective. And the classic poor attitude. I don't need it. I'm, I don't need to be young, I'm already a young man. I don't need to study, I'm, I'm already a great doctor. I know better. I don't need to go to medical school with you guys. I don't need to be a pattern analyst. I know, I know patterns. I don't need to study gay. Like, I know a couple words. And, you know, and, but what happens is, the point here is that life and the archetypal journey of life will never be, can I say force, constrained? You choose the word. Mandate that you take this next step. So when Neumann makes that point, when he says, like a biological analogy, that when, when development goes well, the only things go well and all that stuff, and all that happens, life is going to unfold okay. 
until there's a problem. The little kid, the little baby developing, some say something new, something happens with the heart, right? Surgeries, watching, monitoring, blood levels, jaundice, all other things that happen, and you watch. And it begins to affect your life forevermore. I don't mean you don't have a good life. You have a wonderful life, but you know. I mean, take the mother or the father of these babies. And those of you that are therapists, you have probably worked with some people that had kids that had some real issues at the beginning of life. You're on, uh, you're on uh, thin ice for a long time. You're scared. You wonder. But generally, it goes okay. Until something happens. Hey, honey, you don't, you don't really want to try out for the team, do you? You're playing the drums. Play the drums in the basement. You, I love the sound of the drums in the basement. You don't need to play with the buddies. You know what happens. You go out to bars eventually. You know what happens at bars, don't you? You've got bad alcoholics, and you've got you to hang out with the wrong people, Steve. Stay in it. What if it's called the classic borderline syndrome in analysis? It's a borderline drama. Don't go out. Hey, you know, I met a girl I kind of like. You're too young. You're Catholic. You're Protestant. You're Jew. Is she Jewish? I don't know if she's Jewish. Is he Jewish? Is he, is he Italian? Nothing. He's Spanish. He, well, then it's not. You can't go out with them. And then you begin to see the, these natural currents of life. And that, I think, is part of the beauty of young stuff. It says there are these natural currents of life. There are these natural tendencies. There are these ontological given and regularities in life. You see, life unfolds in certain ways. Not the same for everybody, but everybody will go through these stages, will be confronted by these stages. He said, however, and this is, again, just read the intro. I read the intro yet again. And it's brilliant. He said, however, when something goes wrong with the unfolding of these natural processes, there's damage to the psychic structure. In the same way, there's damage to the body that will linger for a long, long time. <clears throat> and I come up, and we have a trauma course we do, I think, for two, three years, and I realize why traumas affect people. It's kind of a silly question, right? But I wonder, what, why, why are we so destabilized? Why are we so ripped apart by trauma? And it does seem like a silly question. A trauma... A mother losing a child or a child losing a parent. Severe physical disability, emotional, sexual abuse in families. We know only too well how much these, how often these things happen. Why are we ripped apart? And again, this gave me another part of the answer, rereading this stuff. It's an assault of the natural order of life. Trauma represents an assault to the natural order of life and to the natural unfolding of life itself. We're not meant to go into a field and be wondering, is there, is there a bomb there? Are you my friend or can you kill me? I mean, have you been bought out by, have you been bought out by somebody? You've been bought out by somebody, right? They paid you to, to make, because we've been friends and they know we're close, right? They know we're close, we eat together, we share bread and wine. Maybe we were bought out. Oh my God, no, I can't do this. We're not made to have to go out and look at your brothers and your sisters and kill them. We're not made, even though it's part of history, it's not part of the innate order to have a parent come after a child. In the Bible, it said a child should never die before the parent. What it means is there's a natural order. When the natural order goes awry, we got some big trouble. Because we're thrown into a no man's land. We're thrown into a world where, to use Dr. Kaufman's term, we're not really oriented. We lose an orientation. Do that with the asterisk, we lose orientation. So in many ways, when the trauma comes, we lose our orientation from the natural order. <coughs> The asterisk is there because what happens is as we are diverted from that path of growing up and mom and dad and all the things that we could have and grandpas and the dinners and, and all of the wonderful <clears throat> birthday parties coming up and the first baseball game, the first date, you know, all these things that should, should be part of life. When we are diverted by life and by nature, by those paths, and then also by cruelty, by the cruel things that happen, 
we divert it to an alternate path, to an alternate field. And that field is as richly textured, richly as in deeply, it should maybe deeply textured, better word, as deeply textured as the natural order of fields. And you begin to realize, and this again is part of the brilliance, what I feel is part of the brilliance of, of what Neumann put on the table. He's building from you, he's building from you, but he's adding this to the table. And that you're thrown into another preformed field. And in many ways, you can see as I talk, why Neumann's work is so important as for pattern analysts. Because my work for 30 years has been about field theory, innate fields, architectural fields that have their own tendencies, their own power, their own structure and capability. So what happens is we divert it from this path. And you mourn that forevermore. But you're then introduced into another field that's equally as strong. And it's deeply textured with its own rites of passage, with its own tendencies with his own behaviors, with his own trials and tribulations. And you begin to see that the individual, once they seem to enter that field, they enter and or they enter something that's like an orbiting effect. And you begin to orbit that field. And they get stronger through iterations. Remember, repetition is nature's memory, if you think about it. Repetition is nature's memory. And the early events then become repeated through iterative processes, and they get stronger and stronger and stronger. And then you begin to find that there are certain behaviors and there are certain tendencies and certain ways you go about the world. Save the child that loses a parent. You're born into a world of the death mother, or the death father. And you begin to see that so much of their life is continually shaped by these dynamics. And you say, it's kind of incredulous. It really can't be true that you're going to be shaped by this. Well, we have enough evidence. I mean, Freud struggled with this with repetition compulsion. We repeat, but we don't want to remember. And the other big thing he talked about was the, the brilliance of one of his works when he said beyond the pleasure principle, repetition, it means we do things that do not bring pleasure. Why would you continually hit your head against a brick wall? Why would you continually be, be brought to these relationships that knock the hell out of you? Because you're caught in the field. So as we include more and more of Neumann's work in this journey, we look at other rites of passage. And but look at the passage as in, again, the ego seeking to expand its own horizons, seeking to embrace and to take in more and more of a larger archetypal reality. The archetype, I mean, God's goddess as well, yeah, and ultimately, but they're coming through from experiences. The kid going for their first big job, and we both have sons that are 25 years old, early on, and looking at them getting their job, and the, the excitement, the disappointments, the frustration, and all that goes with it. But when you have this double, triple vision, you realize, my God, this is one huge journey into the collection. And you want to see the different ways the ego is navigating. And you begin to know so much about one or two little pieces of behavior, you begin to read the pattern. I know more than that person. They can't tell me what to do. Or you, you tell me what to do and I'll do it. Did you prefer your company man, company woman? And then you begin to see, say, the individual, either the man or woman, that gets the job and you begin to grow, yes, yes, sir, yes, sir, tell me what to do and I'll do it, whatever. <clears throat> you begin to realize that in and of itself is an archetypal complex. When the ego goes into a collective setting, and the ego is lost to the collective mandates and the collective demands. You could begin reading it and say, okay, what archetypal backdrop has it where you go into a collective setting and you lose yourself so much? Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I won't do the drums my way, I'll do it your way. I'm going to change my whole style to do it your way because that's your drum. I like that. What archetype is it? 
It's the world that they call the Senex. The Saturnian fathers. The fathers that demand obedience of the son and the daughter. And they say, you know what? I don't really care. You want to dress that way? We don't dress that way here. We don't do that. We, we, don't, we don't really begin to have these kind of attitudes here. We don't speak Northern Italian, we speak Southern Italian here. We don't speak this kind of Spanish, we speak this a local dialect. And you begin to read this as a hologram, and that's part of the brilliance of the, of the pattern and analysis work. When you see the person that they begin to do the giving over and the accepting and the dressing, changing the drumming, all that kind of stuff, because of the, the, the structure. And what is the structure? What does the outer world represent for the individual ego? It represents the world of the fathers. And we realize if the individual is having this blind reaction to it, you know there's an afflicted relationship with their own father. And there was never the emancipation or there was some trauma that went on that kept them stuck. So that when they begin to buck up against the father world, it's an inevitable reaction to them. And you can begin to read it. The same way you begin to read faithful women. And women begin to have a relationship and they find all these reasons why not. It's a, a colleague of mine told me great, I said, it's one woman, every time she'd, have, she'd go out with somebody, she said, they're not good enough, they're not good enough, they're not good enough. And then she dreamt one day of having, she dreamt of going out with Harry Grant. <laughs> 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 and then von Franz tells the story of a woman who was very, very arrogant, very, very dear, uppity in her way. Everything was uppity about her. And she had a dream of being in like a pig pen, pig pine, <laughs> rolling around in the mud like a pig. And he said, That's where you need to be because you're much too uppity. <laughs> And you begin to realize, okay, what, what are the things? Now, here's, here's the story. What are the things that on the one side keeps you so blindly obedient to the collective world of the fox? What are those things that keep you from engaging with the world? Not good enough. I can't do it. I'm not going to do that. It's not even Cary Grant or whatever. I'm better than everybody. What are these structures? And you begin to realize it's part of the world of the devouring mothers. The mothers that keep you, the mother's idea, you talk about the natural processes, right? The mothers should want to help us get into the life. I mean, I'll share, you know, it was so powerful. My mother, when I was going to school, I mean, she, she took me and she cried and she cried and she took me and she, and then when I went away to college, she said, you got to get out of here. Mike. You get, get the hell out of here. You got to go. I started out first year at the City University in New York. She said, get out of here. You're gonna make it, you're gonna get the hell out of here. And I remember watching her cry. Just watching her ball like a baby when I when I drove out. The car was loaded up, bicycles and everything. And she knew I had to go. That was gentle and loaded, emotionally loaded. How many other stories do we hear? I mean, look at movies. This is why you to do. To learn this stuff, watch movies, read novels, go out, have a life, and just watch things. How many other stories where they, you, you don't get out? How many times do you just want to get to my to go, go, go to the dance. Go ahead, why don't you go to the dance? Go to your friend's house. How come you never had a date in your life? Well, what's going on here? How come there's no interest? How come you have no interest in driving? I remember working with somebody about driving. The young guy had no interest for a long time in driving. My boy, he was 15 in Vermont at the time. He was 15, you get your license and your permit, and at 16, you drive. He slept out the night. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was camped out on that thing, the little vehicle. He was the first in line. He studied, he never studied, but he studied that driver's textbook. <laughs> days and days and days. And it's like, you know what? And, and, and it gets simple in one hand and profound, as it should be. It's a natural order. And when you look at life a lot of times, you look at it against the, the backdrop of what is the natural order of things? Like how do organs develop? You know, when you look at the little baby, Joanna was coming this week. My cousin is going to cook. She's pregnant now. She's 12 weeks pregnant. And she said she's looking at the baby that will do the sonogram and all that. 
It's just, just some of the size of like a bean. <laughs> and then you, you begin to see things. And, and you hope the processes are going to go well, the developmental things, everything unfolds the way it should. And it's the same when we look at life. When a client comes to you, many of you have therapists, or even just your parents, whatever, it doesn't matter. You look at the life of the person and say, are you engaged in life? Is the ego moving forward? Is the ego charged? Is the ego charged to take on the, the vicissitudes of life? If not, I wonder what happened. I wonder, and that's your job as a pattern analyst. I wonder what happened. And then by some of the symptoms and behaviors, you begin to see what it is. I remember when I first moved up to New England. Actually, I was living in a commune at the time. You know Jack Canty, our chicken soup guy? Mm -hmm. We all lived together. Mm -hmm. He became the ritual in the success. <laughs> Anyway, I was, I was like 24 years old or whatever, and uh, I wanted to get into Jungian analysis. And at that point, I'm going back to like 1972, maybe, whatever. There were maybe five, way before nowadays, there were maybe five million Jungians in the world. And I saw a Jungian analyst in Amherst, Massachusetts, where I was living there. I was on fire. I said, I, call, I called this guy, I called him right up, and I said, I heard you're Jungian. He said, Yeah, I'm Jungian. This is. I said, this is great, let's begin. I want to get my hours in, I want to begin the experience. I want to do this, I want to get in this, you know? They said, great, let's make an appointment. And somehow, my, my, even though I had long hair, I was wearing overalls and kind of doing that whole hippie thing, the city, thank God the city of Brooklyn stuff was there. I said, not for nothing, I asked you a question. I said, yeah, where'd you train? You get the story, right? He said, well, I, I, I was in Zurich for many years. Oh, so you graduated from Zurich. I was there for a long time. He said, I, you know, I did what Jung did. I did my analysis. I read the collector works twice in German. I said, that's really great. So you're, you're certified Jung from Zurich? He said, no, I'm not. I said, well, what are we talking about? He said, well, I, I did what Jung did. He said, you're a liar then. You're a liar. Because you're advertising yourself as a Jungian analyst, but you're not. Let's, let's pause, do the pause button. Oh, we're just being judgmental. What looks like judgmentalism, is such a judgmentalism, many times, it's not about that. It's reading a pattern. Can somebody read the pattern here of what the story is with this guy who claimed to be an analyst? And give it, what's the pattern? Remember, we're, this is about pattern analysis. And what Neumann offers us is the pattern we learn to read patterns by virtue of how the ego is negotiating the vicissitudes of life or not navigating life. Oh, so it's one way to do it? That's what that's one of the complexes. So what do we know with this story? Not competing. Huh? Incomplete. What's incomplete? He didn't go all the way. Education, uh, it's the aware who hasn't done the work. Yeah. Education interrupts us. He <laughs> 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 gave me that word. Education, hey, hey, word. education interrupts us. It is education interrupts us. And wh why would stop? See, again, these are the things you begin to look at when you look at patterns. What would stop? What would interrupt the journey? Hard work. <laughs> hard work. Well, he read the collective work twice. He learned German to read the collective work. That's pretty damn hard work. Isn't that wonderful stuff? Read the field. You see, what Neumann gives with this richly textured archetypal psychic backdrop is that every rite of passage is replete with its own requirements, its own mandates. And we can begin to read what it is that does not allow you to do this journey pretty accurately. And you begin to see the symbols and the signs and the symptoms and the behaviors that indicate, this is going well. How's mommy feeling? You know, how's mommy's belly feeling right now? Everything okay, good enough, okay, a little nauseous, as, as it is, as it is. And you begin to see that the, these natural images convey that the journey is going more than good enough. Then there's the other side. The images that begin to tell us, like, you know what? Or the behaviors. 
it's not really going the way it should. Education and corruptness. Somebody said the poor. It's poor, if you don't know the language, the poor eternist is the eternal child. And when you begin to look at the field of the eternal child, you begin to see there are natural tendencies. There are ways you go about life. It says, you know what? I'm, I'm like you. I'm like a doctor. I'm like a heart player. I practice an hour every week or every three weeks. I practice, you know, I can do that. I practice my Spanish and my Italian a little bit, and I'm good. And this old world vision, and when Neumann says in the piece that Steve read for us, is that it's not so much about the personal experience of life. It's how you navigate the innate psychic structures of life with the ego. I'll say it again, because that, that's the key here. It's not so much the personal in life, what you want and how you do it. It's how the personal navigates the archetypal. And he goes on later, I can't see, I can't see here, to say that <clears throat> When the ego begins the process of taking for itself the contents of the deep unconscious, we are in trouble. And this is what he called the secondary law of personalization. Would you see that first sentence again? When the, ego when the ego begins taking for itself the contents of the deep unconscious and the archetype. These are my needs, my processes. I need, to, I need to, I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to do the Jungian institute the way I want to do it, or not do it because I'm okay and still be a Jungian. It's you begin to create your own universe. And, and again, when you read this stuff carefully, you, know, you realize, again, he's saying this all the way through, especially just the introduction. Reread the introduction. Get a glass of port, a glass of whatever, and read it, a glass of tea. It's so brilliant. And he says the journey of life is navigating these innate psychic structures. And again, the piece I said before is when they unfold well, life is pretty much going to be okay. When there's a severe disruption, we're going to get in trouble. But then the point I was working on this piece in my preparation for the lecture, the secondary law of personalization. It's really what's called introjection, in other words. Now, what he's saying by this thing is when the ego, as you just asked the question, when the ego takes it for itself, I can do it my way. I have my own journey, I have my own path, I have my own style, and all, all these things that we do. They're my images. It's my right of passage, so I can find out how I want to do the journey. You try to do that, go through customs in some countries. <laughs> I'm going to go through customs my way. Go right ahead. <laughs> But it's interesting, and again, if you, if you read this, and I once taught, I'm not going to say the book, I taught Neumann on the way uh, the rabbis, the Tamuri scholars work with the Shiva Bacham. The Shiva Bacham, the Shiva student, word by word, line by line. And in six months, we did five pages. <laughs> it's a great way to study. Maybe we'll do it again someday. I, I would love that. He says here, with the secondary law of personalization, he said, it's a natural process where the ego needs to begin to take in the context of the unconscious. And he says, it's, it's about the journey of projection and introjection. That, that's what we all talk about, the law of personalization. It's saying, them there gods, ain't no gods. There's no Zeus, there's no Hera, there's no Medusa, there's nothing. It's just your own stuff. It's your own mother. It's not it's no archetype. All those powers in the universe is the powers in the universe. It's your power. You got here from Russia. You, you made this journey happen. You study mythology for 40, 50 years. It's your journey. There's no gods and goddesses. And what they, he goes on to say, and von Franz writes a lot about this in her work on projection as well, is that the world began, the universe began, the ego began its journey. You see the parallel? The world, the ego, the child, it's all the same. It begins with, wow. Look, look at my dad. Look at my dad. My dad is the daddy of the world. He's the biggest daddy of the world. He can save me. Daddy, would you slay that dragon for me? Mommy, could you, could you, could you make food for me out of nothing? 
in any minute, mom can make good at nothing. And we begin to project in the beginning of life our relationships with others, especially the child to the parent, are governed by what? Archetypal projections. Either the great mother and the great father or the, the devouring and evil mother and father. And none of this is clear. We're talking about children. It's not conscious. It's not conscious. If the child's abandoned and left, they're going to be brought up in a world that's about the abandoning parent. And I was saying the parents bad. I'm not going there. I mean, parents, parents do things for many reasons. But it, it does still become in that field. And then you begin to see that the, the world for that kid that was abandoned becomes a world of what? Huh? World of abandonment. So, yeah, there were an ongoing world of abandonment because they are caught in that orbit and cycle that goes on and on and on. And they cannot deal with the projection. I just want to say a dream, but I can't go. So, um, <clears throat> so anyway, he goes on to say that one of the, the one of the necessary aspects of the development of process is when you take these projections, daddy, daddy, the strongest or the worst, mommy, mommy, the most incredible or the worst, and the gods, the powers, it's 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 the power of the universe. Oh my God, let me just pray in the universe to be God. God's going to do it for the God and the devil and all this stuff. And they say, it's, you have to, at some point, remove the archetypal, spiritual, transpersonal projections, asterisk by that word, projections, and take it home. Where is this in me? You guys, to me, you guys, especially you foreign people, the foreigners are going heroes. Oh, yeah. I mean, the heroes. Another language, the journey, the finances, the, all the goals, family things you guys do. It, it's, it's true to all. I mean, my mind. You know, all of you. But say, no, no, it's not me. It's, it's, it's the archetype of hero. It's, it's like I have a long extension cord, long extension cord to the archetype of the hero, and that's why I do it. Or well, my mother gave it, my father gave it. So he goes on to say that as we begin to build the ego, you got it? We begin to take pieces and little pieces, and we begin to make the ego a little bit stronger each time. We have to take back the projection. It's not just the mother who's so powerful, it's also you. It's not just the father who's a great doctor, it's also you. And he says, however, and I find you that quote, he's the great thinker. There we go. You okay with this? Yeah. Sometimes I can't sit. Yeah, I'm going to the next page. This brings us to a psychological ph phenomenon which will be fully discussed in part two under the law of secondary personalization. This maintains that contents which are primarily transpersonal and originally appeared as such are in the course of development taken to be personal. The secondary personalization of primary transpersonal contents is in a certain sense an evolution an evolutionary necessity. Wait there one second. See what he said? It's a necessity. You've got to take these object, these universals, take them home. Otherwise, it's always going to be it's them. It's my daddy. It's your mother. It's it's whomever. It's the gods. It's it's the goddesses. The great goddess. You've got to take it home. Okay. Go ahead. In a certain sense, is an evolutionary necessity. But it constellates dangers for which modern man are altogether excessive. It is necessary for the structure of the personality that contents originally taking form of transpersonal deities should finally come to be experienced as contents of the human psyche. Read the last line again. This is brilliant. Read the last line again. It is necessary for the structure of the personality that contents originally taking form of transpersonal deities should finally come to be experienced as contents of the human psyche. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> in many ways, this piece takes us to one of the grand dilemmas we're at in, in history today. Psychologically, in the Jungian field today, and in, in, in the global situation. I think this is, there's a lot of distress here. In ancient times, you had world leaders. 
I mean, some of the indigenous leaders we had, King Priam, some of the great ones, they were connected to an archetypal force. And what, he, what he's getting at here is, it's the estrangement from the archetype that when you do this necessary pulling back some of the projection, where it goes haywire is you pull it back, say, like um, Ag Agamemnon, he says, there ain't no gods. There ain't no gods. My daughter's more beautiful than any goddess in the world. My son's stronger than any god in the world. I'm, we don't need them gods. Clash of the Titans. Watch the movie Clash of the Titans. It's brilliant. It's a third grade movie, but brilliant the way they did this piece. We don't need any gods. And what happened in that movie, which is what happens that he's getting at, is when we have had the gods, oh my God, we have a piece of gods. Please don't be mad at us. You know, take the take our offerings, whatever. Get out of here. Those are my offerings. We're not giving them to them anymore. We're not giving these offerings to them. And then when they attribute to themselves, use the language. When we begin attributing the ego, that which is transcendent and transpersonal, Muri, want to finish your sentence? What? Huh? You kill the connection. Two. To the transpersonal. Yeah. Finish your sentence. Thank you. When we begin attributing, and uh, he's got a great one, I think it's the, the collapsing, the collapsing of the deities and bringing it all into me. It's me, forget the gods, forget the goddesses, and all that kind of stuff, it's all bullshit. It's all really my stuff that I project into the world. And when we take it in, now say it again. You destroy the connection to the transpersonal. You destroy the connection to the transpersonal because you have depleted it by taking it and making it your own. Michael, what's the difference? That seems like you destroy something positive. But a few minutes before you talked about the importance of taking those projections back, and they are in you, positive or negative. So I'm well, a little confused. Yeah, I think Steve read that piece towards the end of it. Maybe came a little bit later. He says, what needs to happen, though? So sorry. This is part of the aging and lighting. Is it a combination? <clears throat> yeah, you want to finish this now? This is down here. Just read wherever you stop and down to the end of this year. Yeah. <clears throat> it's right here, okay? No, we have no respect. But the process ceases to be a danger to psychic health only when the person, when the psyche is itself regarded suprapersonally. Well, stop here one second. You see what you said? Read that line again. But and this is a great way to teach, by the way, this group, line by line. But the process ceases to be a danger to psychic health only when the psyche is, is itself regarded super personally got it so when he's saying when you know these things you're taking yourself they are also archetypal entities it's still thinking of me the part of me but i didn't make these it's still super personal right yeah. got it okay go ahead as a numa have it as a numinous world of transpersonal happening so that's, that's the same. if on the other hand transpersonal contents are reduced to the data of a purely personalistic psychology the result is not only an appalling impoverishment, uh, impoverishment of the individual life that might remain merely a private concern, but also a congestion there of the collective unconscious, which has disastrous consequences for humanity at large. Did you get me there one more time? What's that yes. word? Conge congestion. Congestion. Yes. That's a word. It's brilliant. One more time. Okay. If, on the other hand, transpersonal contents are reduced to the data of a purely personalistic psychology, the result is not only an appalling impoverishment of individual life that might remain a mere, merely a private concern, but also a congestion of the collective unconscious, which has disastrous consequences for humanity at large. <laughs> The brain. So is he saying in a complex way that extreme is the problem? Yes. And lack of integration. So again, yeah, perfect. He's talking about again the process of projection and projection. It's like he says, we have to integrate eventually those things that are out there. The things that were your parents, the things that were our teachers, the things that were our mentors. We, we have to find a way to take them into our own life. But when you just say, well, now it's all mine, it's not all yours. So of course, you got to put it in your life and, and do something with it all. But ultimately, it, it belongs somewhere else. 
you take those ingredients. You didn't make that swordfish. We're a great swordfish last time. You didn't make that swordfish. You cooked it up beautifully, or hopefully good. You know, you cooked it up. But Michael you, cut it. He cut it. <laughs> 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 but anyway, the thing is, if you say, like, like, I love what the, the native people say about this. Um, remember, years, I was a budding Eskimologist many years ago. And I studied all the Eskimo stuff, the Antarctica stuff, and I love what the, back then they call Eskimos. Because in your time, they, 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 they catch, they get a whale, and they, they say, thank you for letting us catch you. Okay. That's, that's giving it back. That's not just a new age nonsense, oh, thank you. For, I mean, I don't think you want to be caught. You know, I don't think fish want to be caught when we get them on the hook. But it, it's giving back, and, and that image captures so beautifully. Yes, I will cook you up and we'll, we'll feed our family and we'll clothe our family, we'll use the blubber for heat and whatever. Um, but thank you for what you gave it to us. So, again, projection means taking the qualities of the transpersonal and the transcendent. Now, again, the asterisk here is really careful. Really, really careful subtle. It doesn't mean making it your own, but it means, I think, fine tuning, developing your own relationship to it. Double half. <laughs> Second part of the asterisk is in a way that's consistent and constant with the nature of that archetype. I'll say it again. I'm going to get to your question now. When we deal with this process of secondary um, personalization, we're dealing with the process where the ego is continuing its journey and seeking to, to build itself up in a good way. It needs to. You ain't going to make it in the world if you don't have some strength. If you don't know what you're doing out there, don't try to get a job. You can't put a drum with the good people who don't go out there. You know what I mean? You've got to know your stuff. What happens many times in the journey and where it gets us, and I love the term, the congestion of, how do you say congestion of what? It's when we begin to do the so-called psychic bodybuilding. It's all mine. This is my stuff. I made this happen. I made the fish. I caught the fish. It's mine. I made this. I wrote the book. It's mine. How many times have we found ways of, of giving back to the spirits when we do things? When maybe when you give a lecture, I don't know what you do with your performance. And Dominique is a really gifted harp and a Celtic uh, musician. Maybe you say a prayer before you go on. Maybe you, you say a prayer to your parents and whatever, whatever gave you this wonderful gift. You say thank you for the gift. It's not false humility. And yes, you better break your your, your tuchus and learning your stuff and all that. But you still say thank you for the gift. You gave me. Thank you for the opportunity to have study with my, with my mentors. You know, I thank, I thank God every day for the opportunity to account for my legs. And then I take their stuff and I will try to work it and develop it and work it and develop. I know I do that. What I'm doing with it is mine. The, the matrix is theirs. Ultimately, the matrix of all these archetypal dynamics is outside of us. And the congestion, I love it, the, the, the congestion of the collective unconscious comes when we, we, we stop the process. No, no, it's all mine. And you can imagine, you get the pipes that's supposed to have water coming through, and you start shoving wax in it, and, and dirt, and wax, in it, and metal, and wood in it, and the water can't flow anymore. It's not flowing because you've starved off that pipeline, the source to the, the, greater, the greater part of life. This is what's going on in modern dream work, where it's all about me. This is what goes on in politics, where it's all about me. I'm gonna change the world, I'm gonna make America better. I'm gonna do, okay, stop it, just stop it. Where, where is there the necessary, not false, but the necessary humility? When 9-11 happened, I mean, we were back in history, which is very recent. Colin Powell was the only voice of Sandy, and I'm not trying to deal with him, but he said the most powerful and right thing during 9 11. When he said, What the hell did we do to make them hate us so much? We're going to whoop them. We're going to whoop those guys. We're going to go and get those bastards and what they do get the horse. What did we do? That's the only word. Again, I'm not trying to say he's a great man. I don't know what about, but that piece was great. 
and you watch that our leaders today have taken it all. Look at me. I mean, who lives in this gold castle? I mean, give me a, a prick. A gold <laughs> castle with how many billions and trillions of dollars? <laughs> And it's, it, this is not a political rant, it's not about that. Because I would say almost everything I try, I, well, I try to do, okay? We, we also, <coughs> what I try to do is look at it through these lenses. So the, the analyst, I'm a Jungian, I do what Jung did, I read the works in German twice. I, I wasn't, I was mad at him because he was, he was slimy and he was really deceptive in certain psychopathic quality. But I also saw the bigger picture right away. So somebody said it here, you don't want to do your work. And, and not only you don't want to do your work, you're willing to take us all down your primrose path because you don't want to do your work. That's like you can read that pattern. And you can read the pattern because you go back and say, what is it in the life of the child that would create the conditions whereby you begin to come up to the collective demands? Play your drums, learn the language, play your instrument, shoot the basket 500 times a day like Larry Bird did, right? That you come up against the collective. And then you say, ah, Larry David, ah, I don't think so. Ah, I don't think I want to do this. I don't need to practice. I don't need to do this. I don't need to pay my bills. I don't need to. And then you begin looking at it again. This is part of the brilliance of Lyman's work, which you hear about from the Wadbo and the body. This, this richly textured archetypal world where we begin to see these tendencies that played out with particular configurations of the mother. The generative, loving, supportive, the castrating, devouring, the matriarchal incest. The, the stage of the Euroboric, where you, the, the Euroboric stage where it is generative, where it's, it's needed. You know, it's why you want to take a vacation to the Isle of Euroboric. You know, you take two weeks and you just kick back and you just do it. But you want to have a round trip there, you want to come back. And we begin to evaluate what are the signs? And we're going to sort of be as we got great faculty this weekend. What are some of the symptoms? What are some of the symbols that say, you know what? We're in the generative mother field. And I don't mean the, I don't mean the, the really gross ones, the subtle ones, the really subtle ones, the subtle behaviors. So when you see this guy coming, I'm going to be a Jungian analyst, but I don't think I want to do that one, that one, that one, that one. And it was Rabbi Heschel who was a brilliant comment about religion, Rabbi Ben Heschel. He said, one of the things I really don't like about modern religion is that we pick and choose. I like this one at the Chinese restaurant. From, I take two from column A and two from column B, but I don't want that, that I don't want that. You can substitute this for this for this. He said, you know, it's not that we gotta be blindly accepting it, but it's not just personal. And in many ways, I think that line, the secondary personalization is profound for us. On many, I mean, we can spend a week on this one line here. Because again, he's saying what's natural is it's a natural build of ego resources. Because if you continue to live by projection, I can never do that. I can never work like a woman. I can never do that kind of treatment. I can never dance like that. I can never dance. I can never play music like you. I'm not even going to try. Right? And that happens. How many kids do you watch? My son was a track star in high school and college. And when he was doing it, they were, they were breaking this, they breaking it, they broke the formula mile. And some kids would say, oh, never, I can't do it. And then I think it was Roger Bannister was the first one who broke the four minute mile, an English guy. And he did scientifically, because really he did everything scientifically, blood levels, oxygen levels, everything. And this is before they broke, he said, I didn't want to do anything again. I mean, you think about it, you think, what would be in a psychic somebody that says, you know, I could, I can learn this, I could do this. And you be in the hope I'm getting this point across. When one says, I think I can, the little engine that could, I think I could, I think I could. The one that begins to have this ego resilience and ego strength that says, I think I can make this journey, that's a field unto the self. And you can begin to read that field and you do your work. The same one that says, uh, I don't think I can, I can never do that. Do analysis in two languages? I, mean, I can never try. Are you kidding me? I can never do that. And again, you see how strongly etched these fields are. So again, sticking with this piece, what needs to happen is you take it in, but you don't ever forget 
It's coming from something greater than you. And that's when Agamemnon says to the gods, you go watch the movie again. I recommend it many times for this. I think we were reading those in Kipay Zeus. And so Agamemnon does the thing, we don't need the gods, my daughter's more beautiful, and the daughter says, shut up, we don't have a daughter that's ever done. And the god said, and I, I see Robert De Niro doing the same. Uh, you talking to me? I don't, I don't really think so. You're telling me you're more powerful than Zeus, than my cousin, than my brother, uh, Neptune, Poseidon? Poseidon, make a way. Make a way. <laughs> <laughs> Just for the hell of it, shake him up a little bit. Throw you down some of those thunderbolts? Throw a couple of them. Throw a couple of those scud ones, the scud thunderbolts. And if you look, and I'm beginning to wind up my presentation, if you look at what happened in the latter part of life, something begins to happen. All the big strengths we had, and we're out there, we're making it, we're making the journeys, and we're, we're pushing through airports, and we're, we're pushing through physical things, and, we're, and all the things we do, slowly but surely, you know, something begins to happen, and you don't have the same stuff. And life itself begins to create a shift. And as Edmonton speaks about the ego self axis, <clears throat> the ego self axis begins to shift where the emphasis is on the ego and making it portfolios and careers and monies and success and skills and all, all the wonderful things. Hopefully, we've done it. Now, again, look from the archetypal perspective. If you haven't done it, if you're in your 40s and 50s and 60s and you don't have anything behind you, what are you even doing? Not for nothing, what are you even doing? <laughs> Or you're judging it. I'm not kidding around, but you get the point. But there are things at this point in life you really you need to accomplish if we have engaged with life in a fruitful, meaningful, productive way, an archetypally sanctioned <coughs> way. And then comes a the point you say, you know what? It's different. Some of us think, some people think about me right now, but then people think about retiring. How wonderful is that? Or cutting back. Have a little time to do your writing, your fishing, or your hunting, or your poetry, or whatever it be. You're too young for this. You, really, you don't think. You guys are the other. It's not for you right now. And if the young ones say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut back. From what? You're going to cut back from what? <laughs> I'm kind of kidding around some years. So I have patients to take two vacations a year. I said, from what? You don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't do very much if you take two vacations. If you did something, you'd be taking like five. <laughs> but anyway, as we age, the process of central version begins, where there's a different center, there's a different core, where it's not so much about the ego in the world, and the ego making it, and the ego. Being at all the stages, hopefully, we hear about this weekend from the integration of the mothers to moving beyond the mothers or integrating or whatever, you moving with the fathers and moving beyond the fathers, integrating with the fathers, the heroic say, the treasures are the thing. These are all, they're not just terms, they're rich, 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 rich domain. The treasure hard to attain is basically finding your destiny. That's really what it is. It's finding your destiny. And that's part, and it's written. It talks about stadial development in the, all through the work. Stadial development means that there are stages to develop. And one stage is those of us sitting a little bit older, you know, 60s, 70s, whatever, we hit a different stage of life. And it's no longer the matrix does not, should not, quote unquote, be on just the ego development. Well, I don't want to do with this training. I don't want to be at this. I don't do it because you want to do it. That's why you do it. I don't know what it's going to take. Does it mean you got to go out in the world and make a practice? It could be, maybe not. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. You're learning because you want to. And an image I'll give you, which is a very controversial one, is, and I've seen this for a long time, yeah, many women in their 60s having dreams of being pregnant, physically pregnant. I mean, literally, 60, 70 years old. Now, in Italy, that would be a good dream. <laughs> right? Because in Italy, they now have 60 or 70 year old women having babies. So grandmothers having babies. 
But anyway, what it means symbolically, it's a deep dark type of age. Because there's a difference in having babies when you're 30 and 40, 40 or whatever, in 70s. So what it means is one is believing that whatever they, they're trying to bring to fruition, they have to do it in the outer world. They have to, they have to bring to fruition that which is growing in them, like they did when they're younger. You don't. You don't have to do it like a 30 or 40 year old. You make your baby, have your baby, and love your baby. You get your career, you build your career, you get your practice, get your medical practice, get your singing career, get your practice as a therapist, develop all of this stuff, your art career, and all that stuff. That's great. It's, it's a different archetypal journey as we age. And the, the central version of the shift comes when it's the shift from the ego, which is the center, and the simulation, you know, all the things we're talking about, to when the self becomes more of the center. And you ask, what is this force of destiny? And what do I do to, to get to it? How do I, how do I embrace it? How do I begin to, to nurture this, this calling? And I think many, in many ways, that's the next major step in this projection, introjection process. Where after you've found, hopefully, a successful way of taking in the contents and making them your own while still acknowledging not that we're taking congestion of the collective unconscious. You're not congesting it. You're letting it flow. You didn't say, you know what? I need it even more from deep unconscious. And if you think of prayer, almost every prayer involves a type of supplication. You bow to. You revere. And you look at images where people just prostrate themselves to some greater force. Archetypally, you see, you're always having this archetypal lens. The archetypal lens is saying you are giving yourself over to something greater. And as a young person, you, you have moments of that. You feel it. I mean, the, the inspiration is what got you where you are in the first place. That any musician, any writer, any therapist, any medical, it's inspiration to begin with. Then with all the other stuff that goes with it. But the next step is when you give back even more. Michael, that's a, that was a beautiful sentiment about the archetypal lens you're giving yourself back to something greater. Yeah. Can you give a concrete example of someone who's doing that? Yeah, I would say one my mentor, Robert Lyons. We have two, they're coming in later today, tomorrow. Two of the women part of the first generation of Robert Lang's community. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Robert Lang's really gave himself over to a vision that he had, which was the power of unconscious truth and unconscious processing. And he and he spent he it was tireless and dogging what he did. He worked 15, 16 hours a day writing, and you never had anybody that read more than him. And he stayed in the steam. And he got his hits, and he got hit, and he got hit, and he got beaten down, and no one liked it. And he was absolutely brilliant. St. Francis is another one. I mean, many of the saints, St. Clair, you know, St. Clair is another one. And they, they stayed with their vision, and they stuck with it. They stuck with it. Oh, I, you want an even better one, my dear? Penelope. <laughs> Penelope. What you think about? Penelope is probably the feminine is product so on. Of, of your question. And you're going to hear about it from my demo. Another prime example of yourself since 1988. Yeah. You've given yourself to that vision, and here you're educating our minds. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And that's the treasure hard to attain when you find it. And you know, another part of the gift of this stuff is if you're ever fortunate enough when you're with somebody, maybe your kids or grandkids or a patient, you get a sense of an intimation of destiny in that person. When you drop a little seed, a calculator once I would drop a book, like the Dancing Wooly Master. Who's all the Dancing Wooly Master? I don't know Dancing Wooly Masters. I'm from Brooklyn. I don't know Dancing Wooly Master. The Chinese restaurant. We're going, okay, we're going out to Chinese food today. We're going to the Dancing Wooly Master restaurant. He dropped that book and he said, What the hell is it? He said, Just read it. He became the foundation of the book. It became the foundation. He, 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 in Italian, the scenario doesn't mean one thing. Of the, the latitude, longitude, this position doesn't mean 345, you love the term, but it's an orientation. So it's like, that's the matter. You're destined to be in the city. 
You're destined to educate. You're destined to, to know about nature. That's a big major part of your life, okay? And you begin to get a sense for somebody. You know, I tell some stories that go on with somebody when I have a talk. When you see it. And again, where it ties into knowing it is you, you, to get to that, there are stages you have to go through. Stadio development archetypal processes. The psychic structures that one meets in it, not the personal structure. The personal has to navigate these archetypal structures. Or archetypal, whatever word you want, entities. And then he talks about the structure and capability of psyche. So in order to get to that destiny, you may have that destiny. What is the grail legend all about? The grail legend is there's a vision. I'm going to be this. There's something I really want. It's something about mythology. I don't know what the heck it is. And, and 20 years later, you kind of stick with it. You're talking with it. And you got what well, you got to study biology. You got to go to graduate school. You got to something. You got to study foreign language. You got to study, maybe you got to study Egyptian. You don't want Egyptian, you want Greek, or because you have the Greek stuff. You got to do it. I'm sorry, Charlie. If you want a degree, you got to do some of this. <laughs> Those we see as parts of the going with them your, your words, the great mother, the devouring mother, the great mother, the devouring father, the great fathers, the, 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 the dragon fight, I mean, Sir George and the dragon. It's just brilliant when we understand, I think Bonnie did cover some of that section, what it means when there's a dragon fight. It means the eagle has got to the point where it has its strength and it's gonna go back to mom and say, mom, I'm not gonna buy your stuff on one. <laughs> well, the dragon fight, well, oh, oh, he calls it killing you. We're gonna, we need to soften that language because it's not the best. But when you go back to the father, say, Excuse me, you try to take me down long enough. I want to get my own pizzeria, I want to get my own story. He told me every time, don't do it. Not enough. It's over. It's over. That is a prerequisite for entering the stage of the hero. <clears throat> The hero has to emerge out of a context, an archetypal context. The hero has to need to undergo certain things. To get this, not what I'm thinking, or what or body, or, or <coughs> anybody in the room. It's not what we're thinking as a hero. We have our own ideas, but you realize, guess what? And Campbell was one of the ones that really told Eliot helped us understand it. Guess what? Look at the high degree of regularity in all the hero figures in the beginning of time. Excuse me, there's some major similarities of heroes. From Superman to Batman to the Batwoman to Superwoman to, uh, to Jesus to Moses to whatever. They all ate kale. <laughs> <laughs> they ate kale. Well, but when you find that there are certain things that they had in common and certain rites of passage that they go through. Every and more and stuff. I don't know much is going to get this weekend. Every hero, you begin to find what else does the man, a test question. What does every hero also have in common in terms of their parents? Abandonment. Uh, good, happy, halfway there. Abandonment. What else? He brings back to the community about the parents mm -hmm. before before the, the community stuff. Sometimes one is a deity. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's called you know, dual birth, dual parentage. They have every hero has two sets of parents. They have their parents, like Superman. Marlon Brando is Superman's father. <laughs> so he's on his planet, and they, they put him in a little pod to save his life. They send him off, and he's then taken up by human parents. Do we know that theme anywhere else? And how about the Jesus story? Moses. Huh? Moses. Moses, yeah, it's all through these stories. Now, excuse me, those of us that are Catholic, Christian, whatever, is there a similar ritual in our lives? I, you know, as Catholics, we have, right, Donna? Baptism. Yeah. What happens at baptism? You have, you have the godparents. You know that? You, you see, this is what I love about this stuff. It's basically every human drama every human institution and ritual we have is archetype the godparents that we have for our kids are a way and i, I remember talking to priests about when we had my son's baptism i said 
He said, do you know what it means? We had, I don't know. <laughs> tell, tell us more about it. What it means. He said, this is to remind your child of the spiritual heritage. Oh, my God. Isn't that beautiful? So the dual parent means you're born in two sets of parents, the human and the divine. The divine and abandonment, you're right. And abandonment means the abandonment is usually of the divine parent. But again, like the second and first organization, you never forget it. Mm -hmm. But you have to like have a little amnesia for a while. I'm just really Clark Kent. Mm -hmm. I'm not really Superman. I'm just really Clark Kent. I'm a little kid in school here. Got kind of big power, but maybe I'm a little muscle. Mm -hmm. it's pretty, it's pretty. So you see, all of these rituals are so deeply etched in not the individual, but the collective side. And our work as pattern analysts is to learn the symbols, learn the patterns. Why would I dream of two sets of parents at all? How, how many kids? A common fantasy of many kids is what? They're adopted. Yes. They're adopted. <laughs> They're adopted. Maybe it's wishful thinking sometimes. <laughs> you really, you really not my, I really didn't come from your life. Did I that? Well, they adopt other parents. We adopt them. Okay, exactly. Mm -hmm. Very good. Adopt the parents. And what it all means is that when the child either was I really adopt, I really your kid, or I no, they're my real parents over there. What you're really having is what? What is happening in the child at that moment? You're the therapist and you hear that's going on. What do you know is happening for that child? Where are they archetypally? They're trying to emerge. Uh, there could be a lot of things going on. It's a, a major, one major thing I'm thinking. That's what I'm getting at. That's the specificity. The major thing going on is they're beginning the, the journey of having a relationship between the trans person and the person. Sure. So as a clinician, you see where it comes in? That? As a clinician, you're informed. They're saying, well, you're not really my parents. Or that's my real parents. Or the musician are my parents. Or the doctor are my parents. The artist are my parents. You're informed as a therapist at that moment that your work is to help that client do what? To live in two worlds. Get your artwork out, get your things, stretch your canvases, you can get that work and buy your things, whatever. Go learn your language, go do your stuff. At the same time, you know, thank God you get that gift as an artist. Both are true. And that's, that's the other, the informative part for clinicians, for patterns, okay? Whether you're a therapist or not, you're as a pattern analyst, you know your orientation at that moment is to help that person begin to straddle both worlds. I'm a person of all the needs of a person first. I drop my tea, I have a good day, I'm not seeing as well, I'm getting along. And also, you get this other side. Both are true. And the image, you see, the image comes in to alert us. And I go back to when the open comments I made. Jung and Norman both make the point, they say, that the unconscious produces images. I'll finish that sentence now. The unconscious produces images to initiate the process of assimilation and integration of unconscious contents. I'll say it one more time. That the unconscious produces images for the purpose of initiating and exciting the ego to begin the process of assimilation of unconscious contents. And we are iconographic. We're all iconographic. We, we are all imagistic and sound as well. Between sound and images, you're out in the ocean and you see a swirl happening. Something, something, there's something happening. It was all flat water. Swirl. Wow. What is it happening? Something's happening. A piece of art, a, a piece of music, and you suddenly, oh my God, what the hell happened? You're taken over by it. Never the emotion, you're taken over by it. That's how you respond. Michael, I don't know if it helps with that paragraph that we reread several times. It's not either or, it's both, it's both. and the two. Both. Exactly. Great point. It's both. And again, the danger comes, the congestion, when we forget it's both. But where also the, the both and gets tricky to. It's not either or. Well, I know, but where that gets very difficult in modern culture, in modern therapy, modern young and circle, is since both are true, my opinion is just as relevant as the objective opinion. 
my way of navigating this right path is just as important as anybody else. That sounds like you. That sounds, that sounds like, like you. Or. What, what you're saying is 100% is accurate. I'm just saying what happened in the faulty translation. Okay. And that, that's the congestion of the customer point. The faulty translation. I could do my yummy training any way I want to do it. I don't have to go to the institute, I have to take classes. Because it's, it's either wrong. My way, whatever. So, again, so going back from into the dual birth, you begin to see that this is part of the, the innate structure, psychic structures that are born into the personality. So when the child comes up and says, you know, hi, you yeah, wouldn't even look alike, mom and dad. <laughs> There's, a, there's that great movie with uh, early Steve Martin. He's born into oh, an Afro American. Sure. Yeah, he's born into an Afro American family, and he's he's a white he's child. Terrible. And he says, "I don't know. I feel different. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It must be me. I don't know. I feel different. Wow, you are different." Well, so anyway, but, but it's so powerful because the, the thing is, the psyche is informing us. It's informing us by the image. What your work is. If they, if they say, well, you know, I'm going to do it all my way. It's all my way. That's not both, right? It's just my way. You know what your work is about. If somebody comes in, the early example I gave, well, you tell me how to do it a good way. I do it exactly your way. I do the drums your way. I do the young in your way. I do the CC your way. Whatever. I do the lecture exactly what you want, Michael. Whatever you want, you I'll do. That's an archetypal structure. And you begin to learn how to read it. So the final piece is to say that I think it is a love story. I think ultimately this is a love story. Like any love story, there are a lot of tragedies that go with it and some beauties. And it's a love story because it's, it's trying to em really embrace the soul, to embrace the destiny that you are born with, to find ways that you are able to go through those processes to get to that treasure hard to obtain. And your question, who did it, okay? There, there are certain things you do to get to the hero. You don't just uh, play Monopoly and say you get a free, free turn on the game. You, you avoid all the stops. And you begin to see as a, as a pattern analyst and a clinician that there are certain stops we make. There are certain things we have to do in this journey. And again, where, where one may accuse, oh, it's rigid. You got to learn. You got to learn certain beats. You got to know how to do it because you got to rudiments. Do rudiments. There are certain rudimentary things. You got to do verb conjugations. I remember when I was studying Pan, I one summer I studied five hours a day for my summer. Ball. It was a, I loved it. Comic books, movies. I look at dictionaries. Look at one word, you get fifty words. Look at fifty words, you get a hundred words. And yeah, I loved it. But it's rudiments. I ate, you ate, he, she ate. We ate, you ate, they ate. I ate yesterday, ate five years ago, I ate, you know. And, and, uh, it's a great word. It's, it's, and it's when you see that one tries to hopscotch over some of these stages. It's not just that, but you begin to understand what archetypal dynamics enabled you to hop over. Not in a good way, but maybe encourage you to hop over there. And how do we then help get you back on track? Because another comment they made is that neuroses is being out of step with the archetypal. Neuroses is being out of step with the archetypal journey just becomes a journey we want, not both. I think. And, and that's why I say it's a love story, because if done well, you begin to see something emerge that's just really very beautiful about our life. People can pull out from under whatever the complexes are, whatever the, the terrors are, and ultimately find maybe the terror you're living with, well, the personal and all that, is the terror of living your destiny. So, on that note, thank you, Butch, for doing all the technical body and all the wonderful people at Psychology Alliance. Thank you, and all of you, thank you for that.